ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. We're we got this convo already going because uh, I have a really special guest today, someone I'm really excited to be sitting with. We haven't really ever had the chance to have a proper conversation like this outside of just Instagram DMs. Mm. Partly because you live on the other side of the world, even though I've been spending a lot of time over there, you know. <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite musicians right now, man, I'm a big fan. Ibrahim Malouf is with me. Thank you, man. Uh, Very nice being with you. Man, okay. I, there's so many things I want to talk to you about or really ask you about. So, most recently, I was lucky enough to go to the North Sea Jazz Festival and I saw your set, which was so powerful. And what really resonated to me because that was my first time seeing you play besides like on videos online. It's so anthemic, right? And you cross so many genres and here you are. It, it, it's, it's so limiting to call you a trumpeter, like a trumpet player. Cause I don't know. You just, it, you, first of all, you have your own sound, which I want to get into. I'm just putting five questions into one. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready, but hit me. So what I loved <laughs> at North sea jazz festival, first of all, your show in an arena packed anthemic, your tone is incredible. Like I, I loved seeing jazz, like let's just say jazz for now, like jazz, classical, French, Lebanese, hip hop, everything that you do, all this cross genre. But to see it on that level, on, on a stage that big and to see it being appreciated on, on that level, just for me as a, as a fan of multi-genre music, it made me really happy. And then to see you doing it and to hear the crowd like screaming your anthems, like you're playing, you're playing like chants, like, but on the trumpet and then the crowd <laughs> is chanting along. So like, Man, how, how are you you? I guess is my question. <laughs> how did you develop That's a nice to say. This? You know, I think that I have I've always tried to reach the most sincere music I could play. I, I've always tried to avoid imitating things that I love, you know, because it felt to me that I love it, but it doesn't mean I have to do the same. You know, I love jazz, I love classical music, I love hip hop, I love all kinds of music. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much like you, I think. I love yeah. a little bit of everything, you know. I, I've been listening to African music, to Indian music, to everything. So when you really love music, this, the way you love people, and this is my case, all kinds of people, um, you don't select them. You know, you, you cannot say, oh, I just want to talk to people who come from this country or who believe in this God or or, or who like eating this kind of food. You, you just talk to people because you like people. You're not going to select them depending on how, how they look like or who they are from, where they are from and who they are and all that. You don't select that, right? Mm. So it's exactly the same for me with music. When I'm creating my own music, I don't want to choose. I, I just want to do everything I love, you know, in one music that it's close to who I am, yeah, and and that's that's it. Uh, and I don't really care if it doesn't have a name or if I don't. I'm, I'm even gonna tell you I don't even care if people like it or not. Mm -hmm. I just do what moves me. Yeah, and that's why you're so special <laughs> because you're. I mean, you're so authentic, and you just are giving what you want to do. Which I think, as an artist, is a really special things. A lot of people get caught in the mess of trying to please others, trying to write music for this reason or that reason. Uh, it's also the, the music industry that is yep. so cruel, you yep. know, and, and you, you have, sometimes you need to correspond to something because this is how people might sell you the best. And, right. and you're worried, like, if I don't do this, people will not uh, be interested in me or they will not be interested in selling me or, you know, yeah, I has I have always been very independent and a little bit rebel. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't care. Is that the Lebanese side of me? Maybe <laughs> these Lebanese rebels. I'm learning more and more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say let, let's put it this way. Yeah, but French, <laughs> maybe French too. Yes, you know it's the two together. Revolution, revolutionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, the rebel side and the revolution side together. Yeah, I'm so a, sorry. You're <laughs> half revolution, half rebellion. <laughs> yeah. Ibrahim in a, in a bubble. <laughs> so, um, tell me about your trumpet. You, so your, your dad invented, uh, this like new quarter tone trumpet, right? Y yes and no, but yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll develop it if you want. Please. Uh, when my father arrived, we are originally from Lebanon and my father was a, a farmer in the Lebanese mountain 
in the beginning of the 60s. He was 20, 21. And he didn't want to uh, live all his life poor and farmer in the Lebanese mountain. He was hoping for better for his life. And uh, he discovered an old trumpet that was belonging to ancient fanfares, you know, uh, that um, uh, used to play when Lebanon was part of France. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point it was a um, mandat, we say, mandat français, which means that it was part of, so it was like another part of France, you yeah. know. So they used to do fanfares like the French way, à la française, à la French. And so my father saw this trumpet and he tried playing on it and he loved it. So he decided like three, four years later to move to France to study. But he didn't want to play only classical music. He wanted to play um, Arabic music, mm -hmm. you know, Lebanese music. So he tried to understand how a trumpet works. And he understood that it was very easy, actually. You just have to add a valve and it lowers a quarter, mm -hmm. quarter tone. So he went to Selmer, um, the, the you know instruments, yep, Selmer, the trumpet manufacturer, and he asked them, "Can you can you do this for me?" And they accepted. But then, a few years later, he discovered that there was another guy who did exactly the same, exactly in the same time, which is Don Ellis, mm. and he did this in you know Don Ellis was an amazing trumpeter, yeah. and he used to travel a lot to India and to Asia. So he made exactly the same invention that my father in Los Angeles, and my father did it in Paris. It, that was exactly the same moment. Wow. And Selmer did both? No, Selmer did my father's. Right. And I don't remember the name of Someone the manufacturer. Else. Yeah, yeah, in Los yeah. Angeles, yeah. Wow. And then, so, so your father is a trumpeter, your mother is a pianist, you grew up in a musical household. Yeah. Um, but so you were born in Lebanon, raised in France. Mm -hmm. You left because of the civil, or your family left because the civil war was happening at that time, which obviously obviously went on a lot longer than expected. Seventeen years. Yeah. Yeah. Way too long. Um, we'll get into Lebanon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so so that was your first trumpet. Was your dad's trumpet? Yeah, and this this specific one with the quarter tone. Yes. is the one I hold in my hands the first time. And I've always been holding a, a quarter tone trumpet. So I've never ever played any other trumpet than this one. And that in and of itself has helped you develop your own distinct sound because like as it, it, any instrumentalist, it's really hard to develop your own sound. I'm a drummer, right? So as a drummer to, to like be able to listen to a record and be like, oh, that is Chris Dave on drums or whatever it may mm -hmm. be, right? Like, but you really have that as a trumpeter. Like I hear when I, if I hear your trumpet and I hear it on a, tr I don't know what we're listening to, whatever. I'm like, that's Ibrahim. Oh, th thanks, man. But uh, I think that maybe sometimes I try to to understand why I kept playing trumpet, even though I didn't like it when I was young. Mm -hmm. My father used to play trumpet at home all the time, you know, uh, classical music, classical trumpet. So he used to play loud and high notes and with a very bright sound and i didn't like it at all yeah I, I i just didn't like it so i don't know why one day i said i would like to try and he said okay if you want to try you're going to be a trumpeter i was like hmm, okay i was 7 years old you know i didn't yeah. know what it meant so i started studying with him and the only good thing with studying with my father is that outside of music he was really very strict so it was not easy to have a contact with him, humanly yeah. speaking, in, in, a, in, the, in our life. For sure. But when we were practicing trumpet, he was amazing with me. He was really encouraging me. He was really cheerful, you say? Yeah. You know, you're pushing me. Supportive. Supportive. Encour encouraging. Encouraging yeah. a lot and helping me and giving me so many advices and being so soulful also with me, you know, and... Uh, and I felt very close to him. And I felt like, okay, this is my father, you know. Yeah. So I grew up playing trumpet, not because I liked trumpet, but because I was closer to my father when I was practicing. Wow. You see? So I, when I was 17 years old, I realized that I hate trumpet. Mm. But in the meantime, I was having a lesson every single day for 10 years. So I was pretty good, you know, in trumpet. Because, you know, when you study so much... At some point, you get better, right? Yes. So, <laughs> so at seventeen <laughs> years old, he he told me you should um, you should go to the Conservatoire de Paris and enter to the Conservatoire. And I said I don't want to do that. You know, I want to be an architect. And I really, really didn't like playing trumpet at all. 
I really wanted to do. I, I wanted to be an architect to reconstruct Lebanon after the war, and I was really into this. And I don't know why. For some reason, it's too complicated to explain. But I decided to try. Yeah. So I I did the competition and I and and I won the competition. I, I got into Paris Conservatoire, and for again, for five years, I've been playing trumpet without liking it at all. Just doing competitions. I I won several comp- trumpet international trumpet competitions, classical music, and I didn't like it. Mm. So it was really very weird. You, like you become divergent. I don't know how you say that. Like yep. you, you, you know, you, like, you're someone, but you are someone else in the same time. So what happened is that when I was 22, I used to compose a lot of music that has nothing to do with what I was doing with trumpet. I, di- I s- somehow discovered that I had in my hand an instrument that I hated, but that could be the door for my happiness, mm. for my joy in music. Why? Because I loved all kinds of music. And this trumpet was able to help me um, make true a dream, which, which was playing all musics on one instrument. And not synthesizers, mm-hmm. you know, and not computers, just yeah. a real organic, you say organic instrument? Yes, yes, you know? oh yes. So you can play Latin music and salsa, you can play classical music, you can play Baroque music, you can play Arabic music, you can play jazz, you can play blues, you can pop and all kinds of things. Then everything has changed. It's like 180 degrees on the other side. Yeah. I started playing completely differently trumpet. I, I changed my sound, everything changed. And I discovered another sound which is close to human voice mm. that suits me much more yeah and then i started enjoying playing this instrument because it was completely another kind of way another way to play another kind of way technique and everything was different i just played my way mm-hmm. right so it's really you discovering you opening up your mind to uh interpreting it in a new in a new way so was it really not not the fact that it was trumpet that you didn't like, but was it more so classical music at the time, maybe? No, I I, I really do love classical music. Yeah. I just didn't like or enjoy playing it. Right, right. You know, you, you can love yeah. uh, music without liking playing it. For know? sure. Yeah, so so this is this is exactly was this was my, my state of mind, you know. And it's funny that you say that because like even without talking to you and knowing that, I really uh, recognize your trumpet as a vocal, like as I was saying, like see, and then seeing you play, people are chanting mm. with their voices your your trumpet melodies. It's actually my the best part in my concerts. It's when I don't play and when people sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what makes it not a trumpet artist, right? A trumpet led artist, like or band, because I feel like that you don't ever see that, like in with a with a, a solo trumpet artist like what what you do with it is entirely just you it's uniquely you i try i yeah. try to i try to be you know when you're when you're a movie director for example and you love cinema you love movies and you're a movie director and you like also acting yeah well you don't have to give yourself the first role every time right uh, right you, c- you can direct the movie and give yourself just a small role or maybe just a good, a nice one, but maybe not the first role. Right, you know? right. And this is what I do in music. I, I, I like producing music. I, I love producing. I love composing. Um, this is actually, this is the only thing I really love doing. It's composing music. I can do this 24-7 yeah. and never rest in my life until the end of my life. I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't mind, you know. But playing trumpet is something I like doing, but sometimes, sometimes. When, when I think it's the right moment, yeah, not all the time. Because you're conducting on stage too during your show, yeah. You're guiding everyone. <laughs> you're music directing. You're you're encouraging the artist to part or the audience to participate. You're yeah. I like sharing. Yeah, and it's a massive. You have a massive ensemble. I mean, I'm sure it scales up and down. And I know you have shows coming up, also accompanied by an orchestra. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah, I mean. I, that that's maybe what moves me. It's yeah. when when I see many 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 people. You know, in in our la- my last concert in in Paris, it was at the Paris Arena. Yeah. At some point in the concert, there was six hundred people playing music in the same time. What? Yeah. 
<laughs> I know that's crazy, right? Arranged? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On stage? Uh, part of them on stage, yeah. but there was not some not enough space, so I put <laughs> <laughs> part a big part of them in the audience. That's amazing. Yeah, is that on YouTube or something? Can I see this? It's actually going to gonna be broadcast on French TV on the twenty sixth of September. Wow, you, you got to have the French TV. Okay, I got to get a VPN or something. Yeah, <laughs> help me. Out. Base is my tech guy. We got to figure out how to hack into the French TV. Well, and he, watch he's, it. he's a Lebanese guy. I saw him, so he definitely will be able to crack that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He'll figure out his way into anything. Um. So and so, how old were you when you, let's say, like found your voice, opened up your mind into this new approach? Twenty-two. Just, Twenty-two. Yeah, I now remember exactly what happened. I I just uh, did my last c- classical competition. Yeah. And I was happy because I I won it. Yeah. But I hated what I was doing. So I took my trumpet, I put it in the case, I closed the case, and I said, my father, this is the last time I play trumpet. And it took me a while, you know, like a few months, to realize that I was doing a mistake. Because, you know, it's the only thing I knew. You know, that I didn't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't cook. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know anything about architecture, even though I love it. I, I'm not a good sport player even though i love sport i don't you know there's nothing i know except composing music you know yeah. and playing trumpet so you know you're 22 23 and what's my future yeah you know <laughs> Be a huge question mark you know question mark and uh you say okay wh- what can i do what what do i know what am i able to do how can i achieve something if there's nothing i know right about so so trumpet was my rescue <laughs> rescue uh, uh, tool. Mm-hmm. And then I changed it my way and I play it my way. So how long was, was that? So you went from being this like award-winning trumpeter playing classical and now you're developing your own sound. So how long was it until you found success with your own artistry and doing it this way? Well, all, all depends on what you call success. What do you call success? Well, you know, nobody knows me in the U.S., so I'm I'm not successful at all for me. <laughs> not nobody. I know you. I know you got a couple sold out shows <laughs> yeah. already already pre sale, which is good. Mm, I, I'm, I think I think it's um, maybe when I won my first award in 2014 in France. Mm-hmm. That was a huge thing because yeah. I won an award where for 36 years which was since it started, since the, since they started this award, uh, there was never anybody else than singers winning it. Yeah, and wow. And suddenly I won that, and there was like, everybody was like, how come he wins this? He's not a singer. Yeah. So it was a huge thing in French. All the newspapers started talk, talking about it, and yeah. who is this outsider who suddenly wins something that only singers win? Yeah. <laughs> so that was a huge, huge thing. Right, and uh, that changed everything for me. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's about success, but it's about suddenly reaching another level. Yeah. Of of um, you know, how to say notoriety? How do you say notoriety in in English? Not, not notoriety. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's also like, I mean, to me, success is can you make a living off your art? Right. It's it doesn't matter what level of income that is right yeah definitely you're right but i was already making a living from right. classical music right but i wasn't ha- happy right but but i'm saying with the transition into this new medium of sound that you've that you're now creating and it's not classical right? yes but you, you know elmo i i never really i didn't quit suddenly classical music and the concerts i was doing and jumped in, into in, this. in emptiness yeah. and yeah, into yeah. this you know I, I i did i tried to do it in a clever way like okay since i'm i need to make a living i'm gonna do it until i can get rid of it right so it took me maybe like one year or something you know to be able to okay okay i need to do those concerts because i'm yeah. producing this album i want to finish it and then maybe i will stop doing this because i have a concert and you know i i, I kind of try to deal with those things in this way I like that. So did you find difficulty in being Lebanese and being accepted in France? Um, not just because it wasn't, you know, vocal, but it's, it's trumpet, but also like, you know, with, with the French being in particular about French people. Mm. Um, 
was that difficult for you to, to be accepted and then also to go because now you're at the point where you you know you sell out arenas in France, so you're obviously um, you know, a, a star there, bring, like breaking boundaries, doing new things. That's that's a, that's incredible. So like, I'm assuming that was really difficult and a long journey. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, but I like you know not to spit in the soup. Yeah. Can you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, French people, French medias, um, France gave me so much. Yeah. And I, I cannot say I'm so lucky that, you know, I have such an amazing audience and people who listen to me and yeah. come to my concerts. I, I wouldn't uh, allow myself to do any kind of critic of how France... Or French people um, reacted to my music, you know, mm -hmm. even though there were some ups and some downs. Right. right. But there is something I can say. It's that once I became bigger, things got a little bit more complicated. Mm. Like, you know, it's like um, we like, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about it openly because I almost never talk about this. But Please. Uh, when, uh, when you're a minority, Mm -hmm. uh, people tolerate you. They like you because you're small, mm. because you're a minority. But as soon as a minority becomes bigger and rules in a in some ways, you know, then they get scared. Mm. You know, so and and I think this is a human. I'm not criticizing. I'm not saying that there's something horrible or terrible or something. It's a human. It's like you. I know it's going to be strange what I'm going to say, but like imagine you you invite some people at your home and, you know, they're very polite and they ask you before opening the fridge, you know, they ask you if they can go to the toilets and stuff like this. But at some point, if they really feel home, they might go and open the fridge without asking you. And this mm -hmm. is where you you have to be very open. And this is where you really do accept them or not. Mm -hmm because you don't have the control on them because they actually belong to your own family, right? So do you accept them or are you going to say, hey, that's weird. Two years ago, he used to ask me. Now he's not asking me anymore. So depending on how much you are ready to accept people who are different, people who come from a minority, uh, that shows how much you really do love them and accept them. So what happened to me is that I'm part of a minority. I'm an Arab, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... People loved me yeah. because I was a minority and I needed help. But at some point, you know, and especially that I didn't sign with a big major company. I did everything with my own label. I actually created my label in 2005 and I did everything by myself. So I have my production company for my concerts, for my albums, for everything, like all the music I compose for f movies and everything I do. Yeah. I produce it myself. So I started to sell more albums than any j other jazz artist who signed in the big major companies. And wow. then it started to be a problem. Yeah. And then I started to read um, amazingly rude uh, things in medias about me. So you see, and this is a human. I'm not saying that yeah. it's, uh, it's not only about racism. It's much bigger than this. It's something else, I think. It's, it's just about how a human re react in general. You know? yeah. That's why I compared it to people who you invite in your home. Right. right. Um, so like, how, does, how does that make you feel and how do you get over that criticism? I accept it. Yeah. The, you know, it's okay for me. You know, but you, when you, it's like taking, it's like, you know, people hitting. Yeah. At some point, you don't feel it anymore. You're strong, right? Right, right, right. right. So it's the same thing. I mean, it's it's a normal reaction. I'm not going to blame people for being scared that some Arab guy might decide what jazz is or what jazz is not, stuff like this. I mean, I, I, I understand them. They're just a yeah. bit scared. And then with time, they're going to see that I'm not scary, that I'm not a threat. You know, I'm, I'm just a musician. And yeah. I might be maybe interesting to deal with. <laughs> but isn't that also like what they love about your sound like you have this arabic sound 
with the quarter tonal and everything. So isn't that one thing that is what they love about you anyways? But it's always like this, you know, it's like in, in your couple, right? Yeah. Like, for example, you know, I meet I meet a, a girl, okay? And I, what I love in her is definitely what I'm going to hate in a few years if we get married. Right. You know, like, for example, my, my wife, she loved me because I was very kind and very generous with people and very humble. And I don't know what, this is what she says. Yeah. And now she says to me, you're too nice to people. You're too humble. You have to value who you are. You don't be so nice. People are going to use you. They're going to use it on you, you know? And this is exactly the same. People love me because I play quarter tone trumpet and, and I put makams in my improvisations and all this. And now sometimes I read reviews about my concerts with, with the same journalists who used to like me 10 years ago say, well, this is ridiculous. He's playing jazz and he puts quarter tone in it. I mean, this is not <laughs> jazz. You see, it's exactly the same. Yeah. It's, exactly. it's about love and hate. That's a really interesting perspective. I uh, think those people love me, but they don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I would love to jump to to your uh, to your wife, your relationship, if that's okay. Um, because I, I I always wonder with two creative people, your wife is uh, you know famous singer in in uh, or Lebanese singer. Um, how do you balance her creativity, your creativity, family? Uh, everything that comes with it, you know, the, uh, cause you get attention from one side, she gets attention from one side, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. How, like, cause that's hard in a relationship anyways. And yeah. then, but it's of course amplified when you have fans and I, ha I have a cliche answer. Yes. Which is we love each other. Yeah. So I love what she does. She loves what, what I do. We have so much respect, you know, and, and also we are so different, you know, yeah. we're, we're both originally Lebanese, but we're so different. The music, the music I do, she doesn't play at all this kind of music. And what she does is not at all the kind of music I'm doing. So we also have like very separate kinds of worlds, music worlds. Right. But we, there are many things that we have in common, you know, and uh, sometimes we even share things. We, we collaborate, uh, we, collab we collaborate on some musics and all this. But I, th I think it's easy because we're very different. Yeah. And she teaches me things and I teach her things. You know, it's not, it's not like we're, and we're not the, the geek kind of people. Like at home, we don't, we almost don't talk about music. You see? That would make sense. Yeah. I feel like that, that's a smart thing to do for the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't talk about music. Sometimes she shows me like pictures and she says, oh, do you like this picture or do you prefer this one? And usually when I say, oh, I think I like this one, she takes the other one. Of course. You know, this kind of stuff. <laughs> so it's really funny. But, uh, but we, 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 and we'll listen, we'll listen to music, but we don't necessarily talk like about arrangements or right. produ production or, you know, right. producing or stuff like this. What about touring? That that's the tricky part. Yeah, that's the tricky part because we have a child and um, and I also have a child from another you know union before. Yeah. So we uh, we, ha we have basically two children. Right. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah, when when I'm away, it's very difficult for her to you know plan things. Yeah. And when she's away and I'm at home and I I, I cannot tour because we don't we don't like to ha to be both of us touring and the children with someone else we don't right, like that right 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 so we always try to share our times in a way that at least one of us is with the children that's amazing and you got to be really generous when it comes down to that she's too yeah well yeah you both have well you're both yeah. arab so you're very generous <laughs> i don't know but 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 she is she's <laughs> yeah she's definitely one of the most generous person i know on earth that's so amazing it's very easy to to do that with her that's got to be really hard because you you have to be considering the other person but you also have to consider yourself you also have to consider your your children um your family their work their desire to perform your desire to perform it's a lot to balance yeah maybe also there's something is that i built a big part of my musical life before i met her yeah so now i can choose i have this uh, luxury yeah to be able to say no to a concert without that it affects me so much right you know i refused tours sometimes because i wanted to stay home you know it and i didn't it wasn't a big deal right in, you know uh and and she also pretty much did everything in uh, and she she built her career before she met me yeah so she's exactly in the same situation, you know. So that that's the good part of it. We didn't meet too early. We met at the right time. 
I love that. Mm. I love that. Well, good on you for doing that. <laughs> you didn't choose, right? You didn't choose. There it is. Um, okay, so your new single with Eric the Architect is awesome. Thank you. Man. Uh, Thomas came over and, and played it for me uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was like, "Whoa!" wasn't expected because I knew I knew you had new music coming out, but I was like, I was not expecting this. Like, it's so sick. Like, <laughs> I lo- it's it's like, thank you, man. It's aggressive. It's hooky. Um, it has your signature sound on it still, even though it's like hip hop. Um, I love it, man. You must be so excited. Congratulations. Thank you, man. And it's doing really well. I saw it already hit a million views on YouTube. Like it's pop, it's popping. Yeah. I mean, we, we need to share it more yeah. and more. Right. And, and, uh, this is very different from everything I've done before. Yes. You know, I've, I've produced 15 studio albums in two live albums you know, and, and every time I try to do something different. And this time I met two amazing young producers, Henry Woz and uh, Newton. Do, the, Henry is American. He's actually from LA. And Newton is from Paris, from Lyon, actually. It's another town in France, a big, big city in France. And they both, I decided to give them, that was the first time in my entire life I share producing with anyone. Mm. I've always produced everything by myself in all my albums. That that was, I think, you know, I felt it was the right moment to start sharing because, you know, I needed it. I needed people who know exactly what is hip hop, what is pop culture, what is street culture. Yeah. That that wasn't exactly, I, I don't know, I, I, I think I needed them to help me. Yeah. And they did an amazing job. They did something crazy. So, it's very different from everything I've done before. Did they do the whole album? Yeah, we worked together on the whole album. So the album is amazing. I have heard it. Okay, I'm I'm one of the I'm in the lucky group that has got to hear it. And you have so many collaborators on it. Seema Funk is on it. Tank and the Bangas is on it. Shalea is on it. Sharon Stone is on it. Uh, it's like it's 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 crazy. D Smoke. D Smoke is on it. Yeah. Greg Reporter. Greg Reporter, man, it's amazing. Yeah. Jesus Molina. Oh, yes, Jesus is on it. Yeah. Who's in L.A. now? He's in L.A., yeah. 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 He came in and played at the last Jam Jam we did out here. Yeah. With that big smile. <laughs> yeah, always. Yeah, always. And looking at the camera. Staring at the yeah. camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's also Mathieu Chedid, who's a huge pop singer in French also, and in France. And and there, no, there, oh, actually, there is one music that I didn't uh, produce with those two cats. Um, it's um, It was actually... Uh, we, we were recording at Revival Complex Studio, Revival yep. Studios, and just nearby the studio we were working in, there was another. There's another studio, and there was a guy working in it, and he just said, "Oh man, just come by and we can do some music." And I was like, "Okay." Like when I needed to rest, I used to go there, and his name is Austin, and I started to talk to him like, "Oh hi, uh, what do you do?" And he was like, "Oh, I, I like producing stuff." And I, so we starting just playing and recording things sometimes you know time to time and then some great song came out from this and i was like wow this is different this is that had nothing to do with the rest of the album but i love it and i asked him do you mind if i add this to my album as a bonus and he said yeah sure man so we added this and then and then i i I got introduced to him differently because not 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 musically but humanly yeah and he said his name was austin brown and then i went to see what he does and that man is amazing he's amazing he's really amazing and i loved it so i loved doing this with him aside to the all the rest of the album you know yep and and we added it as a bonus on the album that's so cool well um i'm gonna play money right now because i want everyone to hear it how does that song start? Do you start putting the beat together or was that it? you got Eric on later? Yes, I, I had him in mind. I really wanted to collaborate with him on this song. And, um, you know, when you invite someone as a guest to do a featuring on your on one of your musics, it's always good to have uh, something to suggest first, you know, like with a melody and a concept, an idea, what the lyrics would be about and yeah. the thing is that Eric and I we share many things and among those things architecture he's actually his stage name is Eric the architect yeah, yeah, yeah. as I told you I wanted to be an architect too yes. so we have some kind of passion for 
architecture and for everything that is shaped in a certain way, you know. So we like the the um, we like three D, right? We we like building things. We like stories. Mm-hmm. We like things that move in in space. So when he arrived to the studio, I sang him the da na 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 na. I sang it to him, and he said, "Hmm, I like that." And then I told him, "Okay, um, this is the the concept." I would like to talk about the fact that sometimes in this world, this world, we think that we control things because because we have money. And then after some time, we discovered that money was actually controlling us through mm-hmm. someone else. And, yeah. and this someone else is also controlled by someone else and it's, get, and it's bigger and bigger and bigger and this never ends actually. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like um, a cycle, you know, And uh, I told him that imagine you are someone who's controlling people with a, like on Matrix, you know, like you, you are in a, in, a, in a place where you have control on everybody. Like you have a joystick and you can play with people the way you want. That you can just change the direction they're yeah. walking to, through, towards or, this kind of, or make people kiss even they, if they don't know each other, this kind of stuff, you know. And, and at some point they are going to see that there's something wrong and they are going to do a revo- revolution against you. And once they um, make you fall, we discovered that there was someone else controlling mm. this. So it never ends. So he loved it. <laughs> he said, oh man, let's do this. You know, and he started writing lyrics in the studio and then he wrote this amazing text. So you, you essentially wrote. pitched him what the music video would be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, I pitched him the story, which was actually what could be the video. Yeah. But then he wrote his own, with his own words what the story was. Yeah, that's really profound. I love that. So, how is your relationship with money? Um, <laughs> that, that's a strange question. <laughs> uh, well, for a French, you know, people, you almost never talk about money in France. It's like taboo. You yeah, know? yeah. People don't talk about money, so let me let me think a second. I, I need to do an answer, right? Um, I think that one. I when I started earning money enough to never really care about it, um, I invested it in my music. Mm-hmm. I I didn't try to. You say in French, we say capitaliser, capitalize. Like, capitalize, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't uh, try to put it in banks and try to make profit from it. I immediately uh, re, um, invested. reinvested yeah. uh, in, 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 um, in everything I do. So I'm, a, let's say I'm a rich, poor man mm. because I'm actually using all the money I earn into my music and my work. Mm. So I don't have money, but I earn a lot. Mm. So my relation to money is a little strange. I don't like to have. I spend them every time I have. I spend it, but I spend it on interesting things, which is my music. And you spend it on your life, yeah, yeah, and 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 your your love essentially. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like that's actually really beautiful. Your relationship with money because it's not greedy. It's not greedy. Um, it's also I I I I don't want to change my life uh, for any reason i like my life yeah. you know and am i scared i'm scared by the fact that if i you know people f- like when you when you see an artist like me playing in big arenas you think oh he's making money from that and all this the thing is i know i shouldn't say that but the truth is that i'm losing money because i spend all my money on concerts mm-hmm. so so the thing is that <laughs> i know it's it's not very romantic But I'm scared by what money could change in me. Mm. I don't want to be someone else, you know. Yeah. I don't want to change my way of living. I just want to have a normal house, maybe just a little bit bigger, but but the normal house. I just want to have a normal car, maybe just a little bit bigger, but just a normal car. Yeah. You know, I don't. I, I just want to have a normal life. Yeah. You know, nothing else. I I, I like my life. I like going you know, where everybody goes and, and, and just have a normal life. So yeah. I don't use my money on things that could show that I'm rich or anything like that. Right. I just 
directly, immediately spend it on my music. And that actually makes me really happy. I don't think the average music fan understands that when they go and see, so see you or an artist playing in an arena, that it's an investment that the artist is making if they see that many people on stage with them, yeah. right? Because like a DJ or a, a singer that's just playing the track or whatever is just like putting money in their pocket yeah. where an artist that's like, no, I want 20 of the best musicians on stage with me or 30 or whatever oh, is like yeah. paying price per head for each person, not just for them to be there for their day rate, but like the hotel and the travel Absolutely. and the per diem and the, everything that goes into it. Like that investment, I don't think the concert goer pays attention to. I can't help but think that yeah, because <laughs> I know the economics be, behind it. And, you know, yeah. so when I saw you play at North Sea Jazz, I was like, there's a lot of people on stage. And I saw the Metropole, uh, you know, orchestra playing with like Lewis Cole and everything. And I was just like, how do you even make enough money to pay for a 60 piece you don't. You don't orchestra actually. on stage? At That's that. the thing. Yeah. You don't. It's an investment. It's an investment in your art and it shows how much you care because you want it to sound the certain way for everyone that's listening. But in order for you to do that, you have to spend all the money that's coming in yeah. is going right to the, for you to give this performance at the level in which you want to express yourself. Yeah, and the, and the people who work with me, they get crazy because, you know, the first time I did the Paris Arena, so it was like 17,000 people and we lost money even though it was sold out eight months in advance. Wow. Because I brought too many people, too many <laughs> orchestras and stuff. And, and then I said to the people I work with, I told them, don't worry. When we're going to do this again, I just will have maybe like a quintet and we're going to make a lot of money, you know? Yeah. And then slow by slow, like every week or every month, I was like, but you know what? I think we should have just a string orchestra around that. But you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be too expensive. Don't worry. And then, okay. And then next month I was like, but what do you think about a huge brass ensemble? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, but Ibrahim, we, we said that we're going to make money with this. Yeah, but you, you know, I, I think I'd like to have the brass. Okay. And then, <laughs> you know, and it grows, it grows, it grows. And this is how we happen to have 600 people, you know, because like no limits. <laughs> There's no limit, you know. Unbelievable. Ber Berlioz <laughs> Symphony, right? That's so, <laughs> I love that. The artist's mind just like, but how about a huge brass ensemble? <laughs> yeah. Like how many? A hundred? What? Yeah, a hundred trumpet players. But what? where do you want to put them? There's no space on stage. Mm, in the audience. In the audience. What? How are you going <laughs> to... It's always like this. Dude, that's amazing. Um, so... <laughs> To to because I, I would love to talk to you about Lebanon. So I just went to Lebanon for my very first time. Why? It was so exciting. <laughs> I fell in love with a Lebanese woman. Uh, brought me to Lebanon. Well, we were in, we did the Jam Jam. Uh, so we launched Jam Card UK, which is our very first international market. So that was really exciting. And then we launched Jam Card Denmark. So we're starting to open up Scandinavia, and we did the Jam Jam uh, in Copenhagen at Roskilde. And it was a big success. 18,000 people on the stage. It was awesome. Wow. And, uh, and 18,000 people for the jam jam, right? For a massive jam session where you don't know who's going to play. That's crazy. Um, and it was, it was really fun. We did, it with, we did it with Dirty Loops, which was great. And, and a bunch of friends, Dirty Loops and friends. So it ended up being all these. Because it also, the jam jam has to stay true to the region it's in, right? So if we do it in Scandinavia, it's got to be all these Scandinavian mm -hmm. artists. Yeah. Which for me... I don't know. I mean, I know like some Scandinavian artists, but not that many, especially in doing it in Denmark where they speak Danish in such a small country. Right. So we got like the biggest Danish rap group and amazing pops. Anyways, it, it was amazing. But so I was you out have to there do this in Paris. We ha definitely have to do it in Paris. Yeah. We're, and you're my call. We're going to do Paris and man. we got to do I'm your man. the Middle East. <laughs> yeah, too. Cause I've been, so I've been spending more and more time. I, I, I went out and I did, um, I spoke at, so Berkeley college of music opened up Berkeley, Abu Dhabi and they did their very first summit, uh, last year. So, um, they flew me out and I like curated the summit and I hosted it and I moderated panels, except the day that it started, I tested positive for COVID. So I didn't. And it was actually right as I was going, I had Jacob fly in for that too. Jacob Collier brought Jacob over and right as I was going to get in the van with Jacob for him and I to go and meet the president of Berkeley and for me to give the opening speech and announce Jacob right five minutes before I went to give Jacob a hug and see him for the first time. 
I tested positive for COVID. Sometimes there's things that it's better not to know about. Right? Oh, dude. Yeah. So I'm glad I didn't spread it to everybody. That was the Omicron, Omicron days. But anyways, um, I, so I've been, that was my first time in the Middle East and so in, in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. And I spent time there, met my girlfriend, started dating her. And now we started doing business there. And I'm like really kind of really enamored with the Middle East. It's such a uh, it's such a special place. That, I mean, obviously, all the countries are so different from one another. And then you have Lebanon, right? Like the arguably the most different, or the the French, the France of the Middle East. And but, and also when 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 people think Middle East, if they don't know the Middle East, they think that it's all the same. Yeah. But it's like talking about Europe. I mean, Europe totally. is, is Italy has nothing to do with Denmark. Oh yeah. Sweden has nothing to do with Greece, right? But it's all Europe. And there's and they're all microcultures that are like very different. Yeah. Very very different languages. Um, different lifestyles, different tax systems, different classism or no classism or what, like all different things, different, like what's popular, the food, the everything. So first of all, the food game in the Middle East, so strong. Lebanese food's my, yeah. my, my new love, yeah. my number one fave. But <laughs> so, yeah, so I went to Lebanon, um, spent my birthday in Lebanon this year, actually, which was really, Really awesome because I have, uh, so even before um, starting to date my girlfriend, like you've met base here, right? And on top of that, I have I have a large Lebanese community here in Los Angeles. Like some of my best friends are Lebanese. We have multiple people on the Jam Car team that are Lebanese. Um, and so now with with uh, meeting my girlfriend, it was like, okay, uh, I already know a bit about the culture just because I've had experience, but I've always wanted to go. So I was actually supposed to go uh, the summer of 2020, Mm-hmm. My friend was getting married. Um, we have a friend, Ar- Armenian, Lebanese. And uh, and so we were going to go. I was really excited. And then, of course, COVID happened. Um, and so that canceled that trip, which was uh, really sad. And then, of course, the explosion happened. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy that I finally got to go to Lebanon. But I'm also really bummed that I never got to see Lebanon pre-explosion and pre the level of like the economic collapse right now. Um, and, and, and people out here don't, they don't even realize, they don't even think about Lebanon. They don't understand the hyperinflation problem or Hezbollah or just everything that's going on out there and how complex it is and how sadly far away it is from fixing it's, it feels right. Um, without the support system to do it or, or whatever it may be. So, but it, I, it, it's, it's, it looks very desperate Yeah, and it looks you feel helpless. Yeah. But but I, I really believe that there are things that could help make it uh, a little bit better. But those things are a little bit um, uh, abrupt, you say? Abrupt, mm-hmm. abrupt, abrupt. What do you say? Abrupt. Yeah, no, abrupt is correct, yeah. Abrupt. So it, it has to be very, uh, like suddenly, yeah. all those changes. This yeah. is a little bit maybe impossible to change this fast but but that could there could be some some things to develop that could help the country yeah it's not completely hopeless well so when you go there i think that's the most special thing about lebanon is are the people right Mm -hmm. as i'm out there everyone's everyone i met was happy everyone's loving everyone's like like uh, like um like my my girlfriend's family is like so loving so it felt very italian to me yeah very similar very close yeah Yeah. very similar the the mediterranean tie-in for sure and like it's all olive oil when it comes down to it. <laughs> We're all just olive oil. But, it's all over. but so I, I really love that. But everyone I met was so happy, even though like, you know, of course, the second you bring up the economic situation, whenever you feel their heart, you know, pour into the problems and their yeah. emotions and everything from it. Um, so how, how much time are you, are you spending in Lebanon? Are you, are you still living there? You have a, you have a place there, right? But you're. Yeah, I, 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 I go like maybe four, five, six times a year to mm-hmm. Lebanon and I try to spend as much time as I can yeah. um, with my family there. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. The thing, like, the thing you're, you're talking about, about this amazing joy that you can see in people, even though the, the country is totally collapsing. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is something that comes from Lebanese history. Yeah. Um, when, when you when you read a little bit about Lebanese history, it's it has always been huge ups and downs, and people got used to it in a way, which is strange to say, I know, but they got used to it, and the 
crisis don't affect them as much as our spoiled societies, Western societies. Right. You know, like, for example, if I take, let's take, for example, France. France has never experienced any war since the Second World War. Yeah. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the country. They made war outside of right. France, but not in not France. Not on their soil. Not yeah. on their soil. So, 40, so since 1945, which is 70 years, yeah. right? So you have few generations of people who are really sp spoiled by life, which yeah. is cool. I mean, yeah. everybody wants this for their children, right? But the thing is that they really take it for granted. So when something happens... For f when something happens, even if it's not so big or so bad, as bad or as big as what happened in Lebanon every second year, <laughs> yeah. um, they feel that the world stops, yeah. that everything is upside down, that the crisis is huge and they start to worry about and they become sad and they are depressed. And the thing is that Lebanese people are got used to every year You have someone who gets killed by a bomb in the streets. Every every year you have people who um, leave Lebanon because they don't have any 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 more to to, to eat. Uh, uh, there are one million five hundred refugees for a country where there are four million people living. Yeah, you know it's it's a yeah. huge rate. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. crazy. So so. Lebanese people got used to it and they hate saying it, but they are so resilient. Yeah. And they hate this word. They don't want to hear about the word resilience, you know, because they are fed up by this. But the thing is that they are resilient and they live with resilience for ages now. Yeah. Was your wife living in Lebanon before you guys were together yeah. and then she moved to France? Yeah, yeah. Her? She moved to France. Yeah. Uh, she lived 33 years in Lebanon. Yeah. So I'm sure that probably has you over there more as well. Definitely. Um, when you're in the mountains? Yes, we are from Amazing. Uh, from um, a little village. I mean, I'm from a little village. Um, maybe there are like 15 houses in this village. It's yeah. very, very small. And uh, yeah. <laughs> And um, you were there for the explosion? Yeah, I was there. It's crazy. Yeah. What, where, where were you? I was in my village, but the village, uh, from my village, you see exactly the port of Beirut. Wow. Yeah, which is not very common, right? Right. Because it's a mountain. So yeah, yeah, yeah. from my village, you see it. So I remember we were sitting with friends. And my the port was where the explosion was. Where the yeah. explosion was, yeah. yeah. So we, uh, we were sitting with um, my wife and two friends We're just having a good time talking, and then suddenly there is a huge, big uh, bomb. And uh, we heard it. It immediately reminded me when I was nine years old, and there was bombs, uh, you know, in my village. And yeah. I, I used to be scared, you know. I was yeah. Nine. So it reminded me this. So I took them all. I called my daughter and I run to bring her from the second floor to the basement and we all um, went to the basement to be protected and yeah. it's actually the same basement that people used to use during the civil war wow exactly the same one wow yeah so we went there and we stayed there for like 15 minutes and everyone was like worried crying and all this and I said Don't worry. Here, we, we there's nothing that can happen for uh, to us inside yeah. this, you know, uh, basement. And um, and I I started to think, okay, maybe the war starts again. Yeah. You know, people were worried that Israel might um, send bombs and and planes because you know very often Israel actually flies uh, above Lebanon yeah. for surveillance. You know and. Uh, And sometimes people think that maybe one day, you know, it happens again, like in 2006. And, you know, Lebanon, um, July 2006, people uh, lost 
many many people of their families you know we, yeah. we have, like more than 1500 people died and Crazy. 300 something children and all civil people civil civilians you know Horrible. so that was a very very terrible experience for uh, lebanese people yeah. so we were worried that it might happen again so i went out i said everyone stay stay there i'm going outside just to check what's happening and i wrote, i was actually uh, convinced that a bomb um, fell on on my land on my wow. garden it was that loud it was so loud it was crazy and how far is that even though you could see it from the it's mountain like 15 kilometers wow so wow. i cannot even imagine the sound there next to it yeah even i cannot imagine this this is a huge mystery for me and yeah. how can people still hear something after this yeah because where we were it was huge yeah it was crazy like you never even can't even you can't even sound. describe you it really describe it yeah no and i have experienced bombs before unfortunately yeah. i had yeah. two experiences wow. of bombs before Jeez. that was really 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 scary Man. so i went outside and i started to look in my garden to see if a bomb went there <laughs> you know and and then uh, hiba my, my my wife called me and she said oh come on come on come on there's something on twitter so everyone in beirut or near beirut was tweeting the videos of the explosion oh my god yeah, yeah so yeah. we went outside and we were looking okay this is where the explosion was and we we were looking and oh this is the port of beirut so we ran outside and we watched huge. it with all the huge you know the, the oh smoke and all this you know that was really scary and then people were starting to talk about the the sh chemicals that were inside yeah and everyone was scared because the chemical was toxic yeah with with the wind all this smoke started to go towards the villages and we were oh, really no. really worried that our children might inhale you know it, uh, in, yeah. inhale it inhale inhale yeah. inhale it and uh, intoxicate and all this so we were really scared and then after a few days all the smoke was away and yeah we started to understand that something big happened My and God. and for for lebanese people i don't want to say something wrong towards uh, what happens here what happened here in uh, in 2001 9 11 but it's kind of our 9 11 in right Lebanon, you see? oh yeah definitely yeah i mean yeah it's a completely traumatic experience that you can't even comprehend why or what or yeah or anything yeah that's man and immediately, and I'm like, like I guess most people, I couldn't sleep. Yeah. So uh, I was like walking in in front of my house, just walking, walking, walking. I could like, like what's happening? What's crazy? Who did this? Who yeah. Can, how can this happen? Yeah. How could ever anyone imagine something like this? This is crazy. So we we don't know. Nobody knows if it was an accident or if it was a. Done on never purpose. Know. No, nobody right. knows and we will never know when i was just there the silos were on fire oh wow. the silos they were burning down still you know. yeah they were still yeah they were still crazy. on fire there was them like you know whatever supposedly burning down the final evidence mm. or whatever yeah yeah because I, I, I landed that, yeah. and i didn't even <laughs> i didn't know so i was i stayed at first in syphy and i didn't realize that i was like right next to the port right or right anything I, yeah so i was just walking around and i was like but it's all destroyed yeah it's all it's not all, all not all well i mean there's like I stayed in Syphy Suites, which is like a nice hotel, yeah. right? And then, but then, right, like my view from my balcony was a completely blown up Devastated building, place, yeah. which I had never even seen a blown up building before. I've seen like Crazy. destroyed buildings or abandoned buildings, but I was like, "Whoa, this looks man!" Half of Beirut was different. blown by the, know, by the explosion. It's crazy. And then my girlfriend was taking me around, and I was like, "It's so crazy because you see, so much of of Beirut reminds me of Los Angeles." Yeah. The mountains up on the water, yeah. the weather. And I was like, I was looking, I was like, this looks like Santa Monica. Yeah, that's actually why Lebanese people love coming and living here. You know, Let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it, it reminds them a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, it really felt, I was like, oh, I feel like I'm like in Santa Monica looking towards Malibu. It like looks like the exact <laughs> same thing, except for then there's just these like buildings that are blown up, you yeah. know, which is so crazy. Here they are a couple of years later and there's a, you know, a lot of them still there. Mm. But it's, yeah, it's it's such a, such a gorgeous like a naturally gorgeous country and then the people are so gorgeous and and special and uh yeah i just so i, I feel i have such a soft spot in my heart i feel like honorary lebanese i keep saying i'm transitioning into lebanese right now <laughs> you know between because i have uh, not just my girlfriend but i have so many friends that i care about so yeah. much but you know uh, people 
even like people who are not Lebanese at all, for some reason they really like and love Lebanon once they've been there. Yeah, there's oh, yeah. something strong about it. And and when I when I when I um, the next day after the explosion, I actually had this idea of raising money to rebuild. Uh, you know the destroyed areas and all yeah. this, and uh, I I started calling people around me, and even calling like people in the government in France and big big artists, you know, and Sting and people like this, and yeah. I told them guys we need to do something for Lebanon, you know, raise yeah. money to help people, and everybody said yes, and 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 we organized a huge concert a few months after. And Amazing, we, on, yeah, it was on on on. on French uh, national channel, TV channel, and on all channels in Lebanon, live from the Olympia Hall in Paris. That's awesome. And yeah, and we raised like two million something that's euros. That's amazing, that, dude. Yeah, that was really cool. That is so cool. Mm. Good on you. Yeah. <laughs> and was it hard to get that money to Lebanon? No. 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 We, that's one thing I feel like I've been like kind of trying to do research on certain things. How can I help? How can we help? Like what can happen there, especially now that I've been there and obviously I've invested interest and want to contribute in some way or whatever. But like, yeah, when I was talking to a lot of Lebanese people there, they were saying like, oh yeah, you can't like even in terms of giving money or giving grants. Oh, this like, is different because we, we did it with Red Cross. Oh, okay, great. You see, great. so yeah, yeah, yeah. it helps. Red Cross handle, yeah. Yeah, it han they handle everything. Man, well, I'm excited to go back with you. I want to arrange a time I want to be in Lebanon when you're there. And we got to yeah. get we got to get based there too. And, that, and let's do the jam jam there. Yeah, let's do the jam jam yeah. in Lebanon. And It'll yeah, you know, in Lebanon there are amazing musicians, amazing amazing artists. And and not only Lebanese, but like people who are from uh, uh, other countries but they live in Lebanon like yeah. Yeah, like from Syria, from uh, Jordan, from uh, you know, from even African Ethiopian artists who are live in Lebanon, you know. You have and you have a, a, an extraordinary Lebanese scene. Yes. So maybe you should think about it. <laughs> I am definitely thinking about it. I'm definitely thinking. Yeah, a about few it. years ago, like ten years ago, there was um, um, Red Bull Academy yep. in Beirut, and they oh did, no way! Yeah, and they did an amazing work there. They, That's awesome. Uh, they built uh, studios, like recording studios, and they did crazy things. So I think I think there still is lot to do in there well dude we're gonna do this together sure yeah <laughs> let's go um inshallah. inshallah so uh i also want to talk to you speaking of uh incredible african artists so yo okay the uh, we were jamming it today so we drove home from vegas so a uh, disclaimer we're both really tired right now <laughs> i have the jet lag yeah. you have jet lag we drove in from vegas you I'm have the las vegas jet lag yeah. Oh, yeah. That huge flight. <laughs> it's that a huge massive flight. flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more just like the can you handle the turbulence? But yeah. <laughs> um, your album uh, Queen of Sheba uh, that you did with with Anjali Kijo, dude. Oh, okay. I love it. I love it so much. Um, Thank you, man. <laughs> and bass is a DJ as well, or not as well. I'm not a DJ. I'm a drummer. He's a DJ <laughs> as well as working with Jam Card. And uh, so he was. He was. We were talking about jazz, and he was talking about like essentially odd time signatures. And phrasing and like with jazz drumming, like finding the one and where's the one and essentially because because he DJs mostly in four, right? Geek, geek stuff. Yeah, just boom, boom, <laughs> boom. and uh, and so I was explaining it to him before we listened to your album, and then I put on the first song on that on Queen of Sheba, and I was like, "What time signature is this?" <laughs> and the phrasing is so twisted. And then I think I, is it in, was it in five? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, I found it because it took me a minute too. And, but just like the phrasing and like the accents and everything is so weird. Like, so how do you, and it, but, but yet it grooves, right? So it's not, so how do you, how do you find groove in such a complex, um, in such complex phrasing like that? And how do you write that? Um, that well, you said that you're gonna ask five questions in one. This yes. is five questions in one. I do that. Sorry, <laughs> I get I get really excited and then. But uh, <laughs> but I love those questions because it's it actually it's everything is what I love doing every day. You know, like trying to switch easy things to make it sound different. But but when you when you feel it, it's not more than just a pulse. A pulse, you know. Mm -hmm. like, you can do anything on this, right? Yeah. 
like you can talk on this and it sounds like a rhythm and it sounds like a rhythm and it sounds like a rhythm you know everything that is not supposed to be a rhythm if you put it on a pulse it becomes a rhythm yeah so as long as you're ready to dance on it or feel it you accept it yeah it's like inventing words that don't exist right but if i accept it and if you accept it then it's a word yeah <laughs> right so um uh if i say yeah i mean if do do you invent words sometimes sometimes i do that a lot i definitely do you know and yeah. and because i sometimes i don't find the word it doesn't mean there doesn't it doesn't exist i just don't find it so i invent it <laughs> yes you know so i like doing this and in music i do exactly the same all the time like i'm i'm i i want a rhythm but i can't find it i'm trying to listen to things but i'm not finding it but i'm going to do it mm -hmm. i'm going to make it up i'm i'm, I'm going to try doing it so for example the the one you want you you are talking about yes. han yes. so it's a five but i like the idea that the accent isn't on any one of the those um beats it's not on one two three four five it's not like one two three four right. five or one two three four five one two three it's not one two three four five one two three yeah. it's not four it's not five yeah it's somewhere else it's yeah. on the it's on the between the one and the two yeah. So instead of having one, two, three, four, five, one, mm, two, three, four, five, yeah. one, mm, two, three, four, five, one, mm, three, three, four. This is what I liked. Yes. It's like, okay, oh, th this moves me. I like it. And it also, it. and also, different instrumentation was hitting different accent points too, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. I was catching that too. That's that I was like, like, oh, just God. a little bit more complex, but but it's exactly the same thing. You know, it's like just you know, Einstein used to say that to invent something, you have to think near. Pensez à côté. I don't know how you tra translate this. Like you, you, you have to think near the the track, near the the rail, right? So once you have an, I think that it's actually very inspiring when you're working on a music. To once you have your music, to try to just tweak, twinkle something. Like, how do you say? To just like change something yeah. small in it. Yeah. To make it just per shift personal. It a bit. Shift yeah. something small yeah, 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 in yeah. it to make it personal. You know, I love that. Yeah, because you wouldn't think to just put it there. All it's right. like fashion. Yeah, you know, it's like this. It's like food. You know, it, like when you have a cook, an amazing cook, he's gonna do a, a perfect regular carbonara. Right. But then he's gonna just add one little tiny thing little that accent. nobody did before. Yeah. And that's gonna change everything. Yeah. Right? He's gonna add something right in between the two and the three. Yeah, you don't to know. that dish. <laughs> <laughs> Truffle oil or something. <laughs> Just a little bit under this one noodle. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I love that song. <laughs> and Angelique is amazing. Yeah, what's it like working with Angelique? I love this woman. I think I'm in love. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's so percussive and like and then the two of you together, it, it's I, yeah, it works really well. The album's amazing. And she's a and she's a total free spirit. Amazing. And you can do anything and she's in. She's ready to try anything you suggest her. She's she's like a, a dancer who says, "Just make me dance anything you want." Mm. That's crazy, and she, and she's a virtuoso, really. For yeah. sure. Yeah. I want to see you guys. I want I want to see the live show. Did you tour together? Did yeah, we, we we actually before recording the album, we we played it several times in Europe, and uh, and that's why actually we decided to record it. Like we were like, every time every time we used to play it with the orchestra and the band and everyone was like. Ah, it's so good. We should do something. We should do record it and all this. And then one one day she told me, "Yeah, record it. Let's do it." Amazing. And then yeah, uh, would love to talk about our mutual goat, Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> definitely. So I can only imagine for you too, because I know when uh, when Quincy uh, supported Jam Card, that was like a game changer for me. When he like invested in Jam Card and everything, I was like, "Wow!" Just getting the recognition from him is obviously such a huge thing. He's of course. He's he's the guy. He's the greatest living musician, person, influential person on music in the community, in my opinion. Producer, producer, arranger, conductor, composer, everything. But especially for you being a trumpeter, with him being a trumpeter. So, what did that feel? How did you meet Quincy? And uh, yeah, t tell me what it was like for you to to meet Quincy and to like get acknowledged from him, and then for him to become your manager and for you to be with Quincy Jones Productions. Um, well, first thing is that you know when, when you live in Los Angeles and you know that Quincy Jones lives in Los Angeles, it it it's something huge for you to meet him, of course. But when you live in France and you actually were born in Lebanon, and for you he's a god, 
it's something that you can't ever imagine one day meeting someone like him. Yeah. Because it feels so far, so different. You know, it's like another world. So um, I was playing in Montreux Jazz Festival and I, I heard, I knew that, that Quincy Jones used to come every year to the Montreux Festival but I knew he was there for the big artists and for the, you know, for the for Pharrell or for, you know, <laughs> or for like a huge artist yeah, and yeah. for Herbie and, you know, but, but I, I wasn't expecting him to come and listen to my show. And I met Thomas and uh, Quincy uh, Jones production team in Montreux. And they... They told me, you know, uh, Quincy is going to listen to your show. He's going to be on the, on the side of the stage. And, um, and they told me also, don't be sad or anything if you see him leaving the show during the concert. But this is what, what he does in general. He, he doesn't stay. And, it's, and I asked, I remember, I said, but, but what, uh, how, how can I know if he liked the show or not? And I don't remember who answered me. Uh, someone told me, well, you know, sometimes when he likes the show, he orders food. Mm. So, okay, I kept that in mind. And I was like, I mean, if he leaves, he leaves. That's life. But at least I can say Quincy Jones heard me. Watched and you play. He watched yeah. me play and yeah. he heard, heard my trumpet. So I I was playing on the big stage. And um, like every 15 seconds, I was like, just, how do you say it? Like looking quickly. You say sneaking or something? Yeah, you were glancing. Glancing, yeah. You're glancing. kind of distracted half. Yeah, distracted half, and just, yeah, yeah. just looking at him to see if he, if, is he enjoying or not. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, at some point we were like at half of the concert, I was expecting him to leave at some point, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I was always like glancing, looking and da, 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 da. And at some point I saw a huge plate of sushi <laughs> arriving <laughs> towards him. Yeah. And and while I was playing in my mind, I was like, yes, yes, That's it. yes, yes. You got the tip. He's staying, <laughs> you know. So at the end of the of the show, I went uh, directly towards him and I said, "I'm so honored that you're here and that you listen to this show, and uh, I hope you liked it." And he was like, "Oh man, I loved it, man. I love what you do." And uh, you know, Quincy. Yep. So. Uh, I kept He's talking. Like, You're a Scorpio. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. This is one of the first questions he asked me. <laughs> and uh, and he said, "Yeah, I'm a Libra. I'm Libra. Yeah. You're a Scorpio. Oh, nice." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and I talked to him like maybe half an hour, forty five minutes or something like this. And he said, "That's yeah, awesome." Yeah, and he, he suggested me to to keep this connection with the Considerance Production and yeah. work with them. Yeah. So yeah, that was crazy. That was one of. And them. then it just happened. Like that was it. And then and then we, I I started to talk more and more with Thomas. Yeah. Thomas, Thomas Duport. Thomas Duport. Our guy. Uh, yeah. The one actually, and only. Yeah, <laughs> he's actually uh, originally from originally from France, and uh, so it was easy yeah, to communicate. You know, yeah. the connection, speaking in French, and he explained to yeah. me how Quincy Jones works and how yeah. the Quincy Jones production works and so we got along very quickly and easily and he's such a nice person as you know yes so it's very easy to be a friend with Thomas oh yes <laughs> so we kept this connection and we've been talking for years and slow by slow you know after COVID and after all this it started to be more and more serious and yeah and we kept this connection and we kept working together and I know that uh, Quincy follows all this and uh, knows what we're doing and um yeah that's so cool I i'm sure i'm sure that felt amazing even before the sushi platter and everything just like when you're starting the show and you look over and like oh man he showed up and i sent messages to everybody i knew <laughs> like not only not only family and friends like yeah. everybody <laughs> anyone you ever like, met <laughs> do you know what quincy jones is actually right now on stage i'm gonna play now and he's gonna listen to me okay it's just a, just for info. Just you don't, take it. You don't even have to write back. You don't have to write back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and my, you know, family and everyone was so proud and all this. And when I told them, well, actually, it got even further. We yeah. might work together. And it was like, wow, that's crazy. I'm really grateful for for Quincy and for the team and for Thomas and everything because it's 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 um, Quincy has introduced me to so many amazing people like you and and Jacob and 
and dirty loops and all these incredible artists that I'm like now friends with and get to work with and collaborate with just like through him and through the, through the team. And, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been such a blessing. It's a cool group. He, he's a, he's a soul that helped people loving each other. Yes. Definitely. From everything he did oh, yeah. from the big Count Basie, Ray Charles, everything, even the, 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 for TV, for movies, for everything he did, has always been connecting people all the time. And even look. Yeah, he, still. Still, and yeah. everything he's doing, and even supporting Gemcard, even everything he does, everything he invests in is about connecting people. He's a huge example for me. God bless Quincy Jones. Yeah. <laughs> God save the Quincy. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited to go to your show. And you also have other dates right now. So like go while you're listening, go see, go see Ibrahim wherever he's playing. You want to see this show. I'm excited because I, since I saw you at North Sea, it was a festival set and you know, you're, you're bouncing around, you're seeing like four songs from this person, three songs from this person. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to, I want to just like soak up your show from beginning to end. I'm really excited. I know you're going to have arcs and it's going to cross. I'm really excited, dude. And then November 4th, the album drops. The album. Yep. And this album, you what? guys are going to love this album. And the fifth is my birthday. Yeah. So is that why you chose the fourth? Yeah. You're just like Scorpio blast off. Definitely. And you know, I always release my albums on, on fall, on the fall. You say the fall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Autumn. Yes. Right? Fall. Because always? It, always. Oh, no way. Yeah, because it feels to me that summer is already full of things. Um, spring is so beautiful. You know, you just have to enjoy being out. Yeah. Winter is like Christmas and New Year's and all this. But fall, there's nothing. It's depressing because you yeah. just go back to school. When yeah. you're, you know, so I, I really needed something to happen. Nice. So, <laughs> so you did it selfishly or, yeah. or for your own just Not like, for everybody too. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> You're like, I need something to look forward to in November. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay, so final thing. I need some advice from you because, first of all, my Lebanese girlfriend's birthday is November 4th. No way. Yes. Come on. So we got a Scorpio. We got a Lebanese Scorpio. Wow. So, okay, so give me some advice for dating Lebanese women, man. What do I need to know? I know, <laughs> I know they're different. I know it's fiery. It's a Scorpio. She's a Scorpio. Yeah. <laughs> Give me some advice, Ibrahim. Come on. Well, the only thing I can re really be sure about is that Lebanese women, they hate liars. Oh, yes. Really. Like they, it's, like, it's like even if you lie on something small, it's like they lose totally everything. Like they, they don't believe you in anything else. Like the small lie means a huge lie. Mm. So usually they want you to be honest, even on small things. Luckily, is that a good advice? Luckily, I'm an honest guy, yeah. so I'm. I'm, an, I'm. That's good advice. That's safe. But I already got that. Give me something else. I'm, okay. I'm an honest Do you guy. Cook? Do you cook? I cook, but I should cook more. Okay, that's something they like because, okay. they, <laughs> they, because they hate cooking actually. <laughs> so they need they someone to cooking. do it. They hate cooking. No. Yeah. Her mom's an amazing cook. Yeah, the mom is always an amazing cook. Oh, but the, the mom. But yeah, but the daughter, the one you're in love with. Yeah. She doesn't cook. So d does she cook when she has <laughs> kids? Like when does she start cooking? She. She tries, she shows you that she's learning. Yeah. But then you always end up with an Uber Eat. <laughs> <laughs> so why did it stop generationally? Why are the mothers cooks and incredible cooks and the grandmothers, but then not, but not the women of our generation? You know, my, my um, stepmother, you say? Stepmother? That yes. Her, her yeah. mother? Yeah. Mother-in-law. Yeah. My mother-in-law, yeah. she actually, when she comes home, she does something that no other woman on earth does. She cooks every day and she puts it in the um, in the freezer yeah so we have food for f six months <laughs> at home frozen and like it's like in a restaurant mm. and only amazing food Oof. so like my Hiba, my wife she she says okay what do you want to eat now i said oh you're gonna cook something she said she looks at me she said no everything is already ready mom you know Mom cooked already everything. made it for yeah, us. Yeah. So I just pick up anything I want to eat, like mjaddara, for example, or kusamahshi, or I don't know what, like, like very Lebanese stuff. Yeah. And she just takes it and warms it, and <laughs> we have amazing food. And every time my, my um, mother-in-law comes uh, comes home, she does this. So we never, never need to cook anymore. And right. So that's why. Okay, so I need to just continue being an honest guy, mm -hmm. and I need to start cooking more. Yeah, that will help a lot. Oh, but I'm so busy, man. We got things going on, or or I just need to, or I just need to be okay with the constant Uber Eats. I'm okay with Uber Eats or Talabat. 
Det er <laughs> Or Kareem. Or uh, any of the... Because <laughs> my girl's in Dubai, actually. Yeah? Her family and everything, she's raised in Lebanon. Her family's all in Lebanon, but she moved to Dubai like she four years ago. Yeah. yeah, so many t- things to do in Dubai. So definitely yeah. there. Yeah, there's many lots Many Lebanese of people in there. So many Lebanese people. Many, yeah, a huge co- yeah. Lebanese community in Dubai. But I was when I was in Lebanon, I was having Zatar with Zaid. I was, I was in, bro. I'm Lebanese. Yeah, Zatar Zaid is really the best invention ever. It's re- delicious. Yeah. It's absolutely delicious. I, I cannot spend a day without eating Zatar and Zaid. <laughs> it's like, Every day? It's like my drug. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. We should open up. We should start franchising. It actually, you know, it, that that would be a very interesting idea. It would probably do so well out here, but especially that in 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 Los Angeles, you don't you don't have so many Lebanese restaurants. Or, no, you know, no uh, Armenian, Israeli, um, and then it's kind of just like me- labeled as Mediterranean, or there's Turkish. Yeah, there's a lot of different, a lot, a lot of hybrids. LA is a hybrid city. Yeah, it's like it's like mix Japanese American. You know, yeah. <laughs> in Paris you have a, a Lebanese Brazilian restaurant, so it's a mix. Ooh. It's a guy. It's a Lebanese guy Ooh, from the Brazil. Meat, meat game must be crazy. No, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, they have this kind of uh, specific. It's like kebbe, but it's a Brazilian yeah. kebbe. Oh, nice! That's crazy. Yeah, all on the gaucho grill. It's I don't know what he does. Uh, honestly, I, I, would, I wouldn't. Um, I don't cook so much, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. But it's amazing. It's like but I love those kind of mixing. It's very interesting, actually. I'm so excited. We'll do the music, right? All right. Capacity to love drops November 4th. Support your Scorpio brother. And sister. And sister. And sister. (laughs) The tour is out live. I'm going to be at the El Rey show. Come through, come hang. Ibrahim, thank you so much for for talking with me. Thank you for having me. I'm a big fan, dude. And I'm I'm happy that we're friends now, by the way. We're friends. This right there. That's the friendship. We just became friends. Right now. Friends. It's better than Instagram, right? Yes. This is better than any like. <laughs> better than any like that's ever happened. But you're the man, dude. I'm here as a supporter and I, uh, I'd love to help in any way. Just, uh, But uh, even just for now, I'm just going to stream your album over and over because it's the shit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ibrahim, much love. And that's thanks to love. Thomas and the QJP family. Let's get it. Woo, 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 woo.